is 6.30. We're going to call this workshop of the Louisville City Council to order on, what is it today? May 2nd. All right. So we do have microphones live. Everything is, uh, is up and running, so it is very good audio. So if you don't want it heard, don't say it. Um, the first thing we have is the discussion of the regular agenda and consent agenda items. Uh, Council, if you go ahead and take a look at uh, the agenda. We've got uh, consent agenda, item one, item two, consent agenda, item three. And some of these, um, just for the public record, um, some of these are because we are uh, having some challenging staffing like every industry. Exactly. Um, so some of these are our ability to get those services done uh, with the private sector. Um, item four. <clears throat> item five. Item six. Item seven. Regular hearing, item eight. Item nine. Item ten. Item eleven is a second reading. Item twelve. <clears throat> We don't have any closed sessions, that correct? We do not. All right. With that, we will go ahead and move into the workshop session, item B, uh, update of the public safety complex design and construction. And we have Deputy City Manager Eric Ferris presenting 52 slides. <laughs> that, that's Without a finish. Right? <laughs> 52? He has a lot to tell you. Yeah, all my questions. So, Mayor Council, uh, tonight, thank you for allowing us time to present a lot of information on a great project. Tonight, we have in this presentation with us is uh, Chris Squadra with PPV. We have Mr. Stephen Hill, BRW Architects, and we have our chiefs and a lot of other department heads that are very involved in this exciting project. So, let's get going. And again, Again, I would like to remind y'all of the team that we have, of course, with Chris, with PPV, is very involved in day-to-day -day design and forecasting the cost escalation that's going out in the market from East Coast to West Coast. 720 Design with Don Wurzberger is down in the trenches as well, working with staff and on, on this project. BRW Architects, we knew, again, that you know, this is nothing new to you all, that there are design architects. But I wanted to emphasize, again, Ross Shepard brought in as a partner under BRW to help out with the design on the police and fire side of this, of this large uh, facility and large site. We are starting to be engaged with the civil engineers, Hart Goggler, Mr. Uh, John Blacker. And again, uh, we'll show how that is integrated and makes more sense and a very complex integration, and that's really important, but we're starting to do a lot of civil and site work with Hart Goggler, and they're performing well at this time. Of course, our DAG, our design advisory group, is essentially every department manager and personnel in our city that are, are involved or will be involved. I'll add to the list you're seeing there that public services with facilities is intimately involved with the project and the site, uh, parks and recreation, of course IT, uh, and, and various other departments that are very involved in, um, in this project thus far and will remain throughout the project as well as employees at all levels in police and fire will be involved as we as we find out uh, what we're doing. So we're going to slide around and do some uh, different presentations. So we'll just go straight in, and Chris is going to talk to you a little bit about construction manager at risk. I'm sure mm -hmm. many of you are familiar with this process, but um, step one, we issued an RFQ. This is a two-step process, so we issued an RFQ uh, to all comers, um, and they're assessed on the qualifications of the team, uh, experience of the company. We also looked at pending claims, bond rates, uh, change order management, 
And then step two, we issued a request for proposals uh, that came in about a week before the interviews. Um, those proposals were for um, a, a, the on-site overhead, the sample schedule, and a sample estimate and contract comments, and um, we looked at their fee and general conditions and pre-construction services, those kinds of things which were provided in a competitive environment. That's about 10% of the cost was um, locked in at that time. And then we interviewed the CMAR teams to highlight the differences. Um, any questions about the CMAR selection process? Okay. Again, reminding uh, council that you know we did use CMAR successfully in Thrive, which turned out to be a very good uh, design value engineering through the process from the beginning through the end. It was very successful. So how do we select a CMAR? We brought back the 10 candidates uh, for construction to build a facility last briefing in February. And we had some of the top 10 firms in the country. The, the great thing that I noticed was when they walked in for interviews is that they knew our consultants and they knew them, which gave me comfort that we had assembled the right team. But the selection committee was staff. Myself, uh, Chief Deaver, Chief Clements, Chief McNeil, Chief McGrath, our building official Jeremy Booker, and David McAllister. Now our advisory group to that, to that panel with Tracy O'Garrick, Chris Squadron, Don, Jason Cave, and Stephen Hill was very important because we set up an assessment and an evaluation of point factor system to score uh, the various contractors to get down to we had a top four, we got the team in February, but how did we move forward? But this was your selection committee. Again, the top four, I remind you, was Byrne, Core, Hogue, and J.E. Dunn for interviews from 10 to 4. Now, Dunn pulled out. They, they uh, voluntarily retracted their proposal, did not want to move forward, so we interviewed three firms. It was an intense interview with, with questions and presentations, very structured. Chris and, and staff set us up with a very ethical approach to make sure that we were getting the right company for this project and Burn Construction Services uh, scored the highest and we were able to negotiate and make this deal. So Burn is our CMAR. Uh, the other two did a great job and they do things because Gov Core has built projects here. But again, Burn is our CMAR at this point. Burn again built Thrive. Thrive is uh, 90,000 square feet, um, $50 million project, uh, was a construction manager at risk. Um, you know, $50 million project at the time, probably a lot more than that now we built it. Uh, Bob Boland, Public Safety, is a very uh, complex, huge facility. It's 570,000 square feet, over 80 acres. $100 million then, probably a lot more than that now. They have training towers, they have indoor training facilities, they have outdoor, they have police driving tracks. It's, it's, it was a, an older site that had old buildings there, predated uh, World War II, but they renovated some of that. They built new facilities there, a, a great interactive complex and just a monster of a com <coughs> complex to build. And, and the good news is Jason Moore, uh, who was the project manager for Burn, was on this project. He's on, he was on Thrive, and spoiler alert, he's going to be on this project as well. Fire station number three, um, and eight, three is off of FM 34, station eight off of Josie, so Bird completed those as well. And some other interesting architectural features on projects, this one is the Hawk Central Library in Arlington, Texas. It's got some really neat designs inside. I didn't put all that, but again, around 80,000 square feet uh, facility. This is Seguin's Public Library. Uh, has a lot of wood, a lot of natural light, a lot of neat things in it. Again, that Byrne has recently constructed. This one was around 45,000 square feet. Um, the Soto, this is in San Antonio. Uh, this is a five-story building that had renovation of existing and new. Uh, this is a sustainable um, award winner. It's got sustainability running all through the building. It was also the first heavy timber uh, structure that's been built in a long time. So if you get a chance to look at this architecturally, a really cool building that Byrne pulled off and I think it's a fantastic project. <coughs> Who's our team? So, um, J.R. Evans is the principal 
in charge of the project, but you'll see uh, Jason Moore is our construction manager. And again, Jason was uh, on Thrive, was with us every day, every week, every month, and, and for a long period of time, and just a great uh, manager uh, with Burn. You have David Zebarth, who is our senior project manager, and according to Chris and Don, he's the superstar. He's the person that we're going to really rely on on day-to-day -day functions out there, and they've had thumbs up on a lot of projects, so a veteran with Burn. Many of the people that you see under here, Daniel Calkins was superintendent at Thrive. You had Mr. Lee Howell on cost estimation and many others on this team that were successful with Thrive. One point that we did lose Carla, who was on the police side. Uh, she went to a competitor. They're yet to replace the project manager, manager under David and Jason, but they're going to they're going to interview and bring that information to us to replace that person as time moves on. But Byrne is our CMAR. So I'm going to let Chris go back with uh, what's going on out there with the financial world. Yeah, so um, the last time we met, um, we talked about a labor shortage. We had 10.6 million open jobs. Uh, now we have 11.3 million open jobs. Uh, last time we showed this slide, we had six workers for every open job. Now we have five. So the gap is growing. Um, and as we just saw on the previous slide, poaching is going on left and right. And that gap is continuing to constrict uh, all kinds of supply. Um, escalation, um, the last time you saw this slide, I said oil had gone over 90 dollars a barrel for the first time uh, in a while and uh, now it's over 123 dollars a barrel so that's a 30 percent increase since the last time I stood in front of you. Um, roofing subcontractors will no longer sign firm contracts. Uh, they wait until the date that the material ships is when the material supplier will give them a quote. So you, and that's right now seven to eight months out from the time that you signed them up. Uh, Firestone announced that the prices are going up 10%. They said our pricing advisory to our clients is to allow for 10% a month for increasing in poly ISO and, and roof. Probably due to the oil. Uh, electrical panels and breakers have almost doubled in price in three months. I've talked to, in preparation for this meeting, I spent a couple of weeks talking to general contractors, COOs and estimators um, uh, in the North Dallas area, and reconfirmed with four of them today <coughs> that they're still seeing in the first four months, because this is obviously the first, of the first uh, business day of the fifth month, in the last four months, um, they've seen 18 to 20 percent increases in the GMPs that they've been bidding out. That's unsustainable, but it's there. Um, supply chain um, elevators are now out 30 weeks. Generators are out 54 weeks. The Maripol steel plant um, employed 26,000 people. Um, it was the third largest supplier of steel in the world. Um, and it's obviously not, not producing any steel. So um, the consensus is that construction escalation is now at 2% a month. We were at 1.5% per month recently. Uh, last time I was here, that number was 1.5% through the 2022. There is not, um, oil supplies are growing, they grew at 2% from December to now, and um, no one is producing more oil. They're all uh, afraid of the last three times that they ramped up production when prices went over 100. They took uh, bankruptcies and had to lay off thousands of people when the price of oil dropped $50 <coughs> in one day. You all remember that, I'm sure. So the, the production of oil isn't going up. The Saudis aren't increasing their supply of oil. Um, the um, 
OPEC is increasing their supply of oil, and Germany has announced that they will no longer be buying oil from Russia. So Russia's 4 million barrels a day um, is going to be replaced by oil from somewhere else. So that's the big ugly news, is that um, it doesn't take a lot of math to figure out if we're running at 2% a month that in you know, 10 months, that's a 20% hit to our project without any um, way to uh, offset it. And we were originally carrying 9 tenths of a percent per month when we did our bond uh, projections. So we're running about double the escalation that we thought we would. And looking back the last four months, we've seen a pretty big hit. So. Um, some people are saying the war in Ukraine and China um, lockdowns will stall the economy and drag down prices. Some people are predicting a very big recession in China, and that may happen. So that's the happy slide for the presentation. Any questions on this before we move on? I want to be cognizant of time. Okay. We're, we're only 15 slides in. Okay. And we're already halfway done with our time, so my okay. apologies. So we've had parking structure scope increases. Fiber line re relocation was assumed to be fairly simple, and it's a fairly intense um, change. On the 20th of April, we received a new drawing package. On the 18th of May, we'll be giving an updated budget. Um, but now uh, I can tell you that the value options target was $5.7 million. Uh, the last time I stood, stood here, and we have taken some scope um, uh, bites out of the scope in some areas, but the next time we present to you, that target will be going up very significantly uh, based on the escalation and the uh, couple of the scope items here. Um, there's been no change to the schedule. Um, these are the same dates we showed you before. and. Um, I'll give it back to Eric. Any questions on the project controls update? Okay. Can okay, move around along. Temporary locations. Some of y'all may be hearing some of this. We wanted y'all to hear it as it's evolving. <coughs> um, so September, October, we have to move the central fire station away. We have to move police administration and the police department away off the site, as well as fire administration and prevention. So where are they going? Uh, we've looked at several sites, but we're really down to two at this point. Uh, we'll start with the Central Fire Station. This is the First Baptist Church site. You'll see uh, McGee on the east or on the right of the screen. You'll see Valley Ridge to the south. You'll note the, the triangular piece up to the north. This is a four-acre triangular piece that's not being used right now. Remember that government uses can go in any zoning. Again, the group is now expanded with DAG, working with Michelle in planning, engineering, to see how can we service this site. Chief McNeil found it. But again, I think that we're, we're getting, this is a great spot. So we look at how does a modular or a, a temporary fire station look on this site. BRW, as well as the civils, have looked at it. What you're looking at on the upper end here would be a modular fire station. Uh, we'll show you a little bit of floor plan in a minute. Be a modular building either on pier and beam or, or solid slab with concrete improvements coming in the back to the bays. Now the bays will be air supported or steel structure with canvas more of a tent structure type of building. We'll show you what that may look like in a minute. We move the campus to the north. That way it leaves the southern part of this for the church should they want to use it. Chief McNeil and myself have met with the administration of the church. They're really happy to help and do this as a community thing. Uh, staff, we looked at how are we going to get water here, sewer, how are we going to service this. Uh, so the good news is for water, we're going to come straight across McGee, set a meter base, probably a two-inch um, missile, which is less than a bore. We can tie in sanitary sewer to the south to the church's facility. They have a six-inch system to the north that's not uh, capacity, so we can tie in sanitary to the yeah. south. IT and Devin McAllister and Chris's shop, Chris Lee, we have city fiber in McGee, so we can connect and have this station connected to city fiber and city services. 
around twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars, we can get fiber to the station. So the way it would work right now is again, I think we would use their parking on the west as customer and employee parking. They don't use the upper end of this at all. So I think that's how this is laying out. Here is an example of the floor plan of the, the station where you see sleeping rooms, day rooms, kitchens, you'll see the walkway that goes into the base structure. This central station chief will have an engine in an ambulance. Um, and again, the benefits of this location, again, we're going to look at what this would be what your apparatus bay would look like. It's not exactly, but it'd be a, a, a frame and a canvas or tent supported structure with roll up doors fore and aft on the east and west sides. So this is an example of what we're looking probably to buy. We probably have to buy the modular in this structure. Now where we can resell it, or Keith Murray keeps it, puts it out in his yard. He's always looking for something. We don't know yet, but this is what we're, we're looking to do. These are examples of other temporary structures. You can see the framework uh, trusses and lightweight structures here with canvas, and they make them all shapes and sizes. But again, safe environments for our, our personnel and our equipment to be sheltered uh, for up to 20 months. If we look at what's involved in a land lease, again, this location is located in Central Fire uh, Response District, which is very important. This is a quiet area of town. The other location was on the extremity, up on 35. It wasn't safe. It wasn't as safe as this. It was more costly, and just this is a much better location. We would commence the lease June 1st. Doesn't mean we're moving then, but we'll need to construct this facility to be able to move September, October off the site. So we're working to get a lease uh, going fairly quickly, maybe bring it to, back to you all on the 16th. Again, a 20-month term with three 30-day renewals. The rate here is really, really low. Uh, First Baptist has been great to work with. They really want to be good <coughs> stewards of the community, so a great look right there. Again, we've already talked about water, sanitary, which is huge. The other options to this were ranging close to $200,000 for temporary service. This is not that. This is very cheap and very very doable for much, much less. I have a question here. Yes, ma'am. Do you think the supply chain will affect getting that in time? We're looking toward that to see what we can buy on the modulars and the, the tent structure. And stop. <laughs> right. And stop. So yeah. we have options on sizes, but again, the square footage, we have a minimum. And what we need to have our personnel, and again, the engine and the ambulance. So we're, we're looking at that. I don't know, but we're, we're moving as fast as we can to get that. This is pretty fresh off the, off the press. And again, uh, the driveways and the concrete, the church has made, made mention they may want to leave some of those improvements. Drainage, we'll, we'll do. We'll bring back to council a variance package, one variance probably to allow modulars and portables waive the engineering site plan by providing an engineering plan that addresses control of access drive, fire protection, water sewer drainage, and all those things that will be needed, which will make sense for this, this unique situation. And again, we mentioned city fiber. So this is a great location, and we're working hard to get this done. Police department. So the location we're looking, this is at uh, Lakeway and Lake Point to the building there you see. And again, this is how we're looking at about 26 to 27,000 square feet of occupied uh, condition space for the entire police department and fire administration and, and prevention. It won't be the entire building, but you start to see the parking that we're looking at. We may need to get a parking agreement to the north and maybe to the south. We're still looking into this. Again, uh, this is the building from uh, the view of Lake Point or Lakeway. But some information here, again, we're working on, we're, we, we pretty much finished the letter of intent and a pre-lease agreement, followed by a lease agreement we're going to try to get to y'all really quickly. Again, commence June 1st because we'll have to do some renovations on the inside. Again, it's about 27,000 square feet and a, a, a very competitive, affordable rate. And Chris's personnel went out and found this and negotiated this, so it's really been a great thing to get this. I think we'll make this happen. What we don't know at this point is, is Stephen and his team are looking to see, can we get everybody in this 26-8? And the answer is we're not sure. If we have to cut, we'll leave police administration in the annex, and they're okay with that, but if we prefer to have everybody over there with their team intact, we don't know, but we should know really soon whether they're going to fit in that 26-8. So I can't tell you that everybody's going, but we're working on that. Again, we're, we're trying to get to the 16th. 
So again, this picture shows what happens nearly every Wednesday. In this picture, you'll see fire personnel, police personnel, you're going to see facilities, IT, the building official working on the floor plans and space utilization of the public safety complex. So now I'm back at uh, Valley Parkway and Main Street. Remembering right now, we have three addresses over there, 184 North Valley Park, 188, 1100. So we're, we're dealing with the 16-acre site here. So this is a conceptual site plan just for illustrative purposes of how our buildings will sit over the campus. Again, it's important to show the library, the courts, the jail, caring that Stacy and her group will be moving across September, October. Um, it's important to, that, that this is all addressed as one because it is that. But you'll see the fire and police administration administrative building with an apparatus bay, and to the north of that, you'll see again the, the fire station up here to the north. So fire station, apparatus bay, police and fire admin with, with emergency management, centralized training in a two-story uh, facility here with a support garage right now that has 344 spaces plus or minus in about a four and a half, five uh, deck garage. It's really important that we maintain our customer and citizen parking and employee parking here and we're fighting to keep that as well as knowing that when Herring opens in the fall there's going to be a lot more people parking here. Most of the cars you see here today are library staff because Herring's closed but that's going to change. So you start noticing some changes on the site and this is where yep, be a good place to stop. Yes sir. We'll circle back to this yes, sir. when we're done with the general session. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. It is a lot to get through on this. All right, we're going to take a four-minute break, and then we will reconvene into regular session at 7 p.m. call this regular session of the Louisville City Council to order. It is Monday, May 2nd, and we do have a quorum. Um, if we could please, uh, Council Member Troyer, I've got you for the invocation tonight. Please stand and join in a moment of silent contem contemplation. Councilmember Meredith, if you would do the flags. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Got some proclamations. Awesome. You know the world is getting back to normal when the proclamations start getting done. So we have a few to get through this evening. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has uh, asked for city recognition. This is, a, I think, an important part of making sure we. We know who and what uh, is, is growing our community and is involved. So thank you with that. Um, let's see. Audio got a little loud. All right. So the first one I have is for um, Mental Health Month. Do we have anyone here? Come on up. I'm going to read some whereases, if that's okay. That's right. And then if you have anything you'd like to add um, to, to the context, I'd sure, love to you. give you a couple moments. Um, so whereas addressing the complex mental health needs of children, youth, and families today is fundamental to the future of the city of Louisville, and whereas the citizens of Louisville value their overall health and that of their families and fellow citizens and are proud to support observances such as Mental Health Month and Children's Mental Health Awareness Day, and whereas one in five adults has a diagnosable mental health condition, whereas only 
half of Denton County parents are not familiar with mental health services in their community and the need for comprehensive coordinated mental health services for individuals and families places uh, upon our community as a critical responsibility. And whereas there is a strong body of research that supports specific tools that all Americans can use to better handle challenges and protect their overall health and well-being, and whereas each citizen, local business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, and faith-based organization shares the burden of mental health concerns and has a responsibility to promote mental wellness, recovery, and support prevention efforts, and whereas the Denton County Behavioral Health Leadership Team, Denton County MHMR Center, United Way of Denton County, and the Wellness Alliance for Total Children's Health of Denton County, led by Cook's Children's, through their unique partnership and prevention-based approaches to serving children and adolescents are effectively addressing the mental health needs of children, youth, and families in our community. And whereas it is appropriate that a month should set, be set apart each year for the direction of our thoughts towards mental health education and the support of treatment and recovery, and whereas it is appropriate that a day should be set apart each year for direction of our thought towards our children's mental health and well-being. Now, therefore, I, T.J. Gilmore, Mayor of the City of Louisville, do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Mental Health Month and May 7th, 2022 as Children's Mental Health Awareness Day. And I call upon our citizens and agencies and organizations interested in meeting every person's mental health needs to, uni to unite this month in the observance of such exercises as will commit the people of Louisville to increasing awareness and understanding of mental health. I have set my hand to this on the 2nd of May, 2022. So thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Please. So some of this was said on the proclamation, but I've been asked to read this statement. Mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being. One in five adults will experience a mental health, health illness each year, over 167 residents, 67,000 residents of Denton County alone. Additionally, one in five adolescents will have or have a serious mental health illness. But there is hope. Mental health illnesses are common and treatable. We appreciate the city of Louisville. Thank you very much, Mayor. For helping us to increase the awareness of mental health conditions as a resource and a part of Mental Health Awareness Month. Thank you very much. You sure? Yes, Gentlemen, anything? Part of our co-care team, correct? Yes, sir. Outstanding. We appreciate you guys for stepping up and taking on that charge. All right. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Public Works Week. Any of my Public Works team here? Oh, you guys got to come up. Come on. I will tell you right now, folks, the amount of stuff that we do that involves our Public Works team they're everywhere, and these guys work harder than anybody I know, and I am so proud to be able to represent you, and you guys just make me proud every time I see you, and, and the opportunity to throw candy at you every so often is one of my favorite things, so I appreciate you guys. So we're gonna talk about National Drinking Water Week and Public Works Week, and whereas water is a basic and essential need of all humankind and all living things to sustain life, and whereas water is limited resource that should be used wisely and the water supply protected by preventing pollution and conserving water, and whereas public works and utilities provide essential services needed for the protection of health and welfare and of our community and as part of our everyday lives, and whereas the support of a satisfied and informed citizenry is vital to the professional operation of the public works, utility system, and essential programs such as water production and distribution, wastewater treatment and collection, environmental services, street and storm drainage, traffic and fleet operations, and public buildings and facilities, whereas the quality and capability of those facilities as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public services employees, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and committed personnel who staff the public services department is significantly influenced by citizen attitudes and appreciation of the important work they perform, now therefore I, T.J. Gilmore, Mayor of the City of Louisville, and on behalf of the Louisville City Council, do hereby proclaim the week of May 1 through 7, 2022 as National Drinking Water Week and May 15th through 21st, 2022 as National Public Works Week and urge all citizens and civic organizations to understand and recognize the contributions of the Public Services Department in providing for our daily utility needs and protecting the health, safety, and well-being of our community proclaimed today, the 2nd of May. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Anybody? You guys? I mean, there's a microphone waiting. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll just say that, uh, you know, our success is, is the council's success, and, and we appreciate your support, uh, and uh, without it, we may do our job. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. I appreciate it.
And this one I'm going to shorten just a little bit because um, we've been doing it since 2019, but it is one that I think has, has gotten uh, better and better each year. Um, we are proclaiming that uh, May 7th, 2022 is the Main Mayor's Monarch Pledge Day. And we encourage residents to participate in community activities that support and celebrate monarch conservation. Um, some of the things that you see around the city, of course, is a lot more native plants um, within our medians and our right-of-ways and in our public facilities. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. Um, if you want to see what a great uh, wildflower garden can look like, go no further than next door to Thrive. You can actually just see it right there in the median of Valley Parkway. Um, and we are committed to providing habitat and supporting these amazing critters as they come through our city. And what's really great is if we can support them, we also support all of the other native flora and fauna that live within the city. So I'm excited about some of the new plans that we have coming over the next couple of years. But May 7th will be Mayor's Monarch Pledge Day. Do we want anybody from parks or you guys got anything to add to that? I just want to say a quick thank you for the support of our officials, um, our residents, and our city staff who work so hard on this. And just to invite everybody out on Saturday to Thrive Nature Park, where we have our annual Mariposas event from 10 a.m. to 2, where we will celebrate and help educate people uh, about pollinators and butterflies as a whole. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chief, I've got Police Week and Police Officers Memorial Day. Anybody up here to join me? On top of that, I'll have correction offices behind, officers behind me for that. All right, so let's start up with uh, National Police Week. Whereas there are more than 900,000 law enforcement officers serving in communities across the United States, including dedicated members of the Louisville Police Department, and whereas since the first recorded death in 1786, more than 22,000 law enforcement officers in the United States have made the ultimate sacrifice and been killed in the line of duty. And whereas the names of these 22,611 dedicated public servants are engraved on the walls of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C., and whereas the number of law enforcement professionals nationwide who died in the line of duty in 2021 increased by 55% over the previous year, and whereas Texas experienced the largest number of law enforcement officer fatalities of all United States in 2021 with 84 line of duty deaths, and whereas May 15th is designated as Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of all fallen officers and their families, and U.S. flags should be flown at half staff. Now, for, now therefore, I, T.J. Gilmore, Mayor of the City of Louisville, Texas, do hereby proclaim the week of May 15th through 21st, 2022, as National Police Week, and May 15th, 2022, as Police Officers Memorial Day in the City of Louisville, and urge all citizens to make every effort to express their appreciation to the men and women who have sacrificed their lives to guard us and our loved ones against all who would violate the law. Proclaim the second day of May. And someone for uh, correction officers? Awesome. And what y'all may or may not know, some of you do, um, my father was a corrections officer. So um, this, this one strikes a little closer to home than some. Whereas there is no group of Americans with a more difficult or less publicly visible job than the brave men and women who work in our correctional facilities, and whereas correctional officers who work in jails and prisons are currently responsible for the safety, containment, and control of more than 155,000 prisoners in the state of Texas, the highest state prison population in the nation, and whereas the general public should fully appreciate correctional officers capable handling of the physical and emotional demands made upon them daily, and whereas their profession requires careful and constant vigilance, and the threat of violence is always present, while at the same time these dedicated employees try to improve the living conditions of those who are being confined, and whereas the Congress of the United States by Public Law 99-611 designated the first week in May as National Corrections Officers Week in 1987, now therefore I, T.J. Gilmore, Mayor of the City of Louisville, Texas, do hereby proclaim the week of May 1st through the 7th, 2022, as National Correction Officers week in the city of Louisville and urge all citizens to make every effort to express appreciation to the men of, and women of this dedicated and difficult profession. Proclaim this the second day of May 2022. Thank you. Thanks. And I, I think one of those that went out there didn't get signed, so if you can make sure I get it, I will make sure to sign it.
Next up, we have a presentation of certificates of achievement by the city manager to our parks and recreation uh, team. So a couple of those in that department. I believe we have one of the two that are here today. So I'll start with the one who's not here. Um, this is for Matthew Folks, and he is he won at our traps uh, meeting. Uh, statewide competition, the zero turn mower competition. He is number one in our state for handling a zero turn mower. Um, so I, I, I will say that we pride ourselves on having the best of the best at Louisville. Um, and you know, although that sounds really fun at the same time, this shows that we have experts working at all levels of our organization. So congratulations to Matthew Folks. And the next one goes to Erica Tang. You want to come up here? Erica Tang is one of our managers, and she successfully completed the Texas Recreation and Park Society's Dr. Michael and Lord Leadership Academy. This is no small feat. Um, I, I don't know much about it, but I have been told that this is a, you are a, a very high percentage of people, small percentage of the top of the top, creme de la creme of the, of the state of Texas. So um, we are very proud to have you in your leadership. You have really rose, in, ro rose through the ranks in our organization and um, have just been a leader from the moment we met you. So I'm really uh, pleased that you're part of our leadership team. So congratulations. <laughs> Item E, Visitor Citizen Forum. Speakers must address their comments to the mayor rather than to individual council members or staff. Speakers should speak clearly and state their name and address prior to beginning their remarks. Speakers will be allowed five minutes for testimony. Speakers making personal, impertinent, profane, or slanderous remarks may be removed from the meeting. Unauthorized remarks from the audience, stamping of feet, whistles, yells, clapping, and similar demonstrations will not be permitted. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the city council is restricted from discussing or taking action on items not listed on the agenda. Action can only be taken in a future meeting. I do have a request uh, from Mr. Paul Christina of the Denton County Transportation Authority. And if someone can help him by flipping the dais around, that would be lovely. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Christina, if you would please uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Paul Christina of Denton County Transportation Authority, 1955 Lakeway Drive here in Louisville. We thank you very much, sir, for the opportunity to stand here before you this evening and thank you and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Green for your service to our board of directors at Denton County Transportation Authority. I'm here to, this evening to talk about our public involvement program related to our current, current comprehensive operations and fair analysis that's underway right now. On April 18th, we opened public comment for members of the Denton County Transportation Authority service area to provide feedback on our current service and the future of our service as we develop and design a multimodal transportation system comprised of our highly successful Go Zone program, along with our fixed route bus service and A train service that operates between here and Denton. Members of the public are encouraged to go online to dctafeedback.net where they can find a comprehensive list of all of our in-person public forums, online, public forums, as well as a set of um, opportunities to post comments, freeform comments online, respond to a survey, or also go into ideas wall where you can identify places of interest in the service area that are most important to each one of our users. Recently, our board of directors extended the public comment period and it will now close on the 10th of June and we will prepare those comments for our board to make a final service decision at our July board meeting for these service changes to go into effect in November at the end of this year. Again, we appreciate very much the partnership offered by the city of Louisville and your leaders and your citizens' engagement in our board and the work that we do to provide critical transportation services to those who need and want to use it so that we can provide a return on the significant investment that the city of Louisville and the other member services, cities make to our service. Thank you very much for the time. Great to see you. Thank you so much, Mr. Christina. Really appreciate staff and all the work that they're doing. I know there's a tremendous amount of outreach going on in the community right now, so thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good night. City Secretary, do we have any other requests? 
Moving on to item F, consent agenda. All of the following items on the consent agenda are considered to be self-explanatory by the council and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen so request. For a citizen to request removal of an item, a speaker card or e-comment must be filled out and submitted to the city secretary. City secretary, do we have any requests? Yes, please. I'll entertain a motion. I uh, make a move to accept the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second. Council, if you would please vote. Motion passes five to nothing. Item G, regular hearing number eight, consideration of a resolution of the City Council of the City of Louisville, Texas, authorizing the acquisition of fee simple title to approximately 0.531 acres of land described as the Charles DeMay Survey, abstract number 335, including a portion of lot 1-CA, block C, as shown on the plat of Timber Creek Square, phase one, revised, City of Louisville, Denton County, Texas, for the construction of a public park. Determining the public use and public necessity of such acquisition, authorizing the appointment of an appraiser and negotiator as necessary, authorizing the city manager or her designee to establish just compensation for the property to be acquired in accordance with all laws, Authoriz authorizing the city manager or her designee to take all steps necessary to acquire the needed property in compliance with all applicable laws and resolutions, and authorizing the city attorney or her designee to institute condemnation proceedings to acquire the property if purchase negotiations are not successful, providing for repealing, savings, and severability clauses, and providing for an effective date. The proposed property to be acquired will be used to develop a public park in the Triangle area bound by Business 121, Interstate Highway 35, and Corporate Drive. As required by Texas Property Code Section 21.0113, the city is required to first attempt to acquire the necessary acquisitions from the landowners voluntarily through the making of a bona fide offer prior to filing any imminent domain procedure. The landowner agrees to the purchase of the property under the threat of condemnation. Funding is available from park development funds. It is recommended that the City Council consider and adopt the resolution as set forth in the caption above by using the following motion. I believe that motion is in your packets. Um, available for questions is Ms. Stacy Anaya, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, <clears throat> I move that the City of Louisville, Texas adopt the resolution described in agenda item number G8 and authorize the use of the power of eminent domain to acquire for public use the property described and depicted in attachment one attached to the resolution, said description and depiction being incorporated into this motion for all purposes for the development of a public park. Second. I have a motion and a second. Council, if you would please Excuse vote. Me. Oh, pardon? I think it's G8. Did you say G9? I heard G8. G8, okay. I'm sorry, I okay. misheard. Better to, better to have it right than to miss it. All right, we have a motion and a second. Council, if you would please vote. Motion passes five to nothing. Item nine, consideration of a resolution of the City Council of the City of Louisville, Texas, authorizing the acquisition of fee simple title to 23.1740 acres of land described as Burrell Hunter Survey, abstract number 0553, City of Louisville, Denton County, Texas, located along the north line of Continental Drive, west of Barrington Lane, for an expansion of Central Park, including the construction of a hike and bike trail, determining the public use and public necessity of such acquisition, authorizing the appointment of an appraiser and negotiator as necessary, authorizing the city manager or designee to establish just compensation for the property to be acquired in accordance with all laws, authorizing the city manager or her designee to take all steps necessary to acquire the needed property in compliance with all applicable laws and resolutions, and authorizing the city attorney or her designee to institute condemnation proceedings to acquire the property if purchase negotiations are not successful, providing for repealing, savings, and severability clauses, and providing for an effective date. Mr. Mayor, I move that the city of Louisville, Texas, adopt the resolution described in agenda item number G9 and authorize the use of the power of eminent domain to acquire for the public use the property described as and depicted in attachment one attached to the resolution and said description and depiction being incorporated into this motion for all purposes for the expansion of a public park and development of a public hike and bike trail. Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, if there are any questions, Stacy Anaya, our Parks and Recreation Director is available. If there are none, council please vote. Motion passes five to nothing. 
Item 10, consideration of an ordinance amending section 6-101, private utilities of Article 5, Chapter 6, and section 9.5-101, private utilities of Article 6, Chapter 9.5 of the Louisville City Code by amending these sections to provide the city manager with authority to grant easements for private utility lines that serve city-owned buildings, equipment, or other appurtenances, and make other minor amendments necessary for clarity, providing for a repealer, severability, and an effective date, and declaring an emergency. These amendments are proposed to provide the city manager with the authority to approve private easements on public property where required to serve city facilities. This will help streamline city development pro projects and is recommended that the council approve the ordinance as set forth in the caption. Michelle Berry, AICP, our planning manager, is available for questions. If there are none, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve the ordinance. <coughs> Second. Council, if you please vote. Oh. Oh, this is out of order. Okay, this one's a little different. Cool. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending section 6-101, private utilities of Article 5, Chapter 6, and section 9.5-101, private utilities of Article 6, Chapter 9.5 of the Louisville Code by amending these sections to provide the city manager with authority to grant easements for private utility lines that serve city-owned buildings, equipment, or other appurtenances, and making other minor amendments necessary for clarity, providing for repealer, severability, and effective day, and declaring an emergency. I have a motion and a second. Any comment or question? Council, if you please vote. Five to nothing. Motion passes. Item 11 is a second reading, consideration of an ordinance setting forth the Second Amendment to contract an exclusive franchise for collection and disposal of residential garbage, refuse, yard waste, bulky waste, and containerized commercial solid waste and collection, and processing of residential and multifamily dwelling recyclables within the city of Louisville, Texas. On November 16th, 2020, Council approved an exclusive franchise agreement for the collection of residential garbage, refuse, yard waste, bulky waste, recyclables, containerized waste, and multifamily recycling with Allied Waste Systems Incorporated doing business with Republic Services of Louisville Republic. This franchise ordinance provided the cost of disposal per ton for commercial solid waste for disposal at DFW Landfill. This amendment will allow for adjusting the disposal rate per ton when the disposal facility changes. The city charter requires amendments to a franchise ordinance to be read twice, 30 days apart, and go into effect no earlier than 30 days after the final reading. The first reading was on March 21st, 2022. The second reading is on May 2nd, 2022, with the amendment effective on June 1, 2022. Staff does not anticipate a change in service delivery due to this request. And it is recommended that the city attorney go ahead and provide the second and final reading. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council providing for the Second Amendment to contract an exclusive franchise for collection and disposal of residential garbage, refuse, yard waste, bulky waste, and containerized commercial solid waste, and collection and processing of residential and multifamily dwelling recyclables within the city of Louisville, Texas. Item 12. Consideration of a resolution approving the request by Republic Services to increase the disposal rate per ton for roll-off containers disposed of at Camelot Landfill located at 580 Huffines Boulevard in accordance with the franchise ordinance and of an ordinance amending the Louisville City Code Section 2-201 fee schedule to reflect said increase in the disposal rate per ton for roll-off containers disposed of at Camelot Landfill. On May 2nd, 2022, City Council approved the Second Amendment to the Exclusive Franchise Agreement for the Collection of Residential Garbage, Refuse, Yard Waste, Bulky Waste, Recyclables, Containerized Waste, and Multifamily Recycling with Allied Waste Systems, doing business with Republic Services of Louisville, which will become effective on June 1st, 2022. Per the amendment, if Republic can no longer dispose of commercial solid waste at the DFW landfill, it may request a modification to the disposal rate per ton for roll-off containers to match the per ton rate disposal rate at an alternate disposal facility. The disposal rate per ton for roll-off containers at Camelot Landfill is 2860. Thus, Republic has requested an increase to the disposal rate per ton for roll-off containers to 2860 to match the disposal rate at Camelot Landfill. This resolution approves Republic's request and the accompanying ordinance amends the fee schedule to reflect the disposal rate per ton for Camelot Landfill and will go into effect on June 1st, 2022. It is recommended that the City Council approve the resolution and ordinance as set forth in the caption above. Council, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve the resolution as set forth in the caption. And, Second. The, and the ordinance. And the ordinance. City Attorney. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the fee schedule of the City of Louisville by amending fees related to solid waste and recycling services, providing a repealer severability and an effective date, and declaring an emergency. Need a second, please? 
Councilmember Troyer, are you our second? Second. Oh, yes. Thank you, sir. All right, Council, if you would please vote. <clears throat> Motion passes five to nothing. Item 13. Consideration of an ordinance amending the Louisville City Code Section 2-201 fee schedule relating to library fines and authorizing the city manager or her designee to waive all outstanding assessed library overdue, overdue fees. The library proposes modifications to the fee schedule to remove library overdue fees, excluding overdue fees related to mobile hotspots and tablets. Effective May 20th, 2022, the Louisville Public Library will no longer charge overdue fees on late materials applicable to books, DVDs, Blu-rays, binge boxes, audiobooks, music CDs, kits, book club in a bag items, and storytime backpacks, opting instead to temporarily freeze accounts until the material has been returned. This is a departure from using fiscal penalties as a barrier to library services. The library also asks that council authorize waiving existing library overdue fees as of May 20th, 2022, related to the applicable items in the approximate amount of $181,896 in order to restore library services to all patron accounts affected by library overdue fees. It's recommended that the City Council approve the ordinances set forth in the caption above. And I'm going to editorialize for a minute. I think <clears throat> this is awesome. I'll entertain a motion, please. I move to approve the ordinance as stated in the caption. City Attorney? Second. This is an ordinance of Louisville City Council amending the Louisville City Code Section 2-201 fee schedule of the City of Louisville by amending fees related to library fines and authorizing the city manager or her designee to waive all outstanding assessed library overdue fees, providing for repeal or severability and an effective date and declaring an emergency. We've got a little difference in the layout this, this, uh, this month, so I'll check on that with staff. But um, uh, I've got Ms. Uh, Councilmember Meredith as a second for this. Council, if you could please vote. Motion passes five to nothing, and I think that vote is awesome too. Thank you, Council, for the support. All right, item H, reports. Reports about items of community interest regarding which no action will be taken. Um, Council Member Meredith, would you mind being first this week? Absolutely. You would mind? No. no. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I want to give uh, kudos to the uh, friends of Layla and, and staff who were at the inaugural Run Layla event. I thought that was a, a great event, and the trail was uh, absolutely gorgeous, too. So, uh, Also, kudos for the color palooza. I thought that was, to staff, that was probably the best color palooza I think I've seen. Um, probably broke attendance records, I, I would think so. Um, only, only annoying thing was the wind, but I think after the last two years, I don't think anybody cares about that either. So. But <laughs> congratulations. Uh, library report. Uh, story stroll, story time for families with children of all ages, Friday, May 6th to the 10th, 10.30 a.m. No registration required. Central Park uh, on Edmonds Lane. Adult board gaming open to adults age 18 and up, Saturday, May 7th, 1 to 4 p.m. No registration required. Crawford meeting room, and that's all I've got. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Councilmember Troyer? Uh, yes, <coughs> if I can talk. Would you like me to come back? <coughs> Would you do that? No yes. worries. <coughs> city Secretary, City Attorney, anything? I just want to remind you really quick, tomorrow is the last day to early vote, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Election day is on Saturday. Thank you. City staff, we work our way across the tables. No reports. No report, Mayor. Thank you. Sometimes the button works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mayor, just a quick report on the lake level. We're sitting with, with uh, last night's rain at 522.2, so just a little above the conservation pool. Thank you, sir. Nothing to report, Mayor. Chief? One announcement, uh, LISD recently held their annual awards banquet. We had three officers nominated for SRO of the year and Officer Chessa Castles won SRO of the year. She's the school resource officer at the Harmon campus. Thank you. Congratulations. Councilmember Green. Me? Okay. 
Um, well, I was uh, planning to say a little something about DCTA, so um, I'm, I was happy to see Paul Christina here, who stole my thunder a little bit, but I did want to, um, I wanted to mention the importance of these public input meetings, because we have had some significant changes in service um, this past, what, since September. Um, so, uh, you know, it, we realize that right now we're in a place where, um, we need uh, we need to get a handle on um, our needs as a community, and we need to provide that feedback to DCTA so that they can take that data and they can uh, we can put the proper resources towards getting um, the the service that we are paying for. Um, so, if you are if you need to write DCTA, if you want to write DCTA, please take the time to um, attend one of the virtual meetings or one of the in-person meetings, any way possible that you can <coughs> provide feedback so that we can continue to improve. Uh, and then I also just wanted to mention that I believe our animal shelter is pretty full, so I believe that there are all the fees for dogs over 20 pounds are waived until what, Saturday? Through Saturday. I think I stole Ronnie's thunder now. I'll just mark that out. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Jones? Uh, no report. Uh, Councilmember Green stole my thunder. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say refer to her. City Manager? No. All right. Councilmember Troyer. <clears throat> I'll try again. Uh, <clears throat> for the Louisville Grand Theater this month, uh, we have Texas Tunes Blue Water Highway presented by the City of Louisville on May 14th. Uh, Footloose will be pre presented by CYT Dallas, May 20th through the 22nd. Uh, Louisville Grand Theater Songwriting Workshop featuring Bob Livingston will be on May 21st, and that's presented by the City of Louisville. And then on the 22nd, the Black Box Songwriter Series will feature Bob Liv Livingston, um, and that is City of Louisville event. Uh, of course, the acoustic jam sessions occur every Friday night, uh, presented by the Visual Art League of Louisville, and it's a, if you've never been, as I say often, uh, you, need to, you need to go and at least observe. You can, you can join in if you want to, but uh, it's, a, it's a great event. As far as activities go, we have an art, to, art talk by Randall M. Good, Modern, modern Renaissance Artist, presented by the Visual Art League of Louisville. That'll be on May 10th. And then there are three uh, exercise events going on in the plaza every week. Uh, Yoga in the Plaza, presented by Blue Anjou Studios on Wednesdays. Pilates in the Plaza, presented by Pilates in the City on Thursdays. And then Tai Chi in the Plaza, presented by Lowell Johnson, and that will be Saturdays beginning with May, May beginning on May 14th. And then there are two exhibitions going on right now. First of all, in, inspired by the Master, presented by the Visual Art League of Louisville, that will be run from May 7th through June 18th. And Cross Timbers Artists, presented by the City of Louisville, where, running from May 7th through June 4th. And I just, I too want to give kudos to the staff and everyone involved in uh, putting on Colorpalooza. It was a, it was a great event. Um, my grandsons really liked it. Um, so it was, it was a good event. Kudos to the staff and everyone else involved. Thank you, sir. A couple of quick notes. Uh, number one, uh, we had the police banquet this past week and it was outstanding. It was great to celebrate our heroes. Um, we gotta figure out how to, uh, to do a combo, fire and police all in the same week because that would be amazing, all sorts of good stuff. But no, we have um, such great first responders in our city and uh, it's a privilege to be part of that event. 
Um, we also have this Friday is First Fridays here in Old Town, so uh, please come on out. Um, I, my wife is actually out of town, so I am going to be doing First Fridays on my own. So come on out and uh, meet the mayor and have a good time. It's, it's always a great event. Uh, finally, I want to reinforce, um, if you go vote right now in the city election, your vote will have the power of roughly 127 citizens. That's how many people you will speak for. So don't think your vote doesn't count. It does. Um, it does greatly, and uh, we need you to come out. We need more representation out there at the at the voting uh, booth. Uh, hope you all can get out there. Again, tomorrow is the last day of early voting. You can vote at any of our locations in Denton County. If you wait until Saturday, you're going to have to go to your voting location, and of course, you can find that at um, DentonVotes.org, I believe is the website, um, which is an amazing website, great resource. If you don't know who to vote for or what to vote for or any of that stuff, just go on there, input your information, and it will spit out a, uh, a ballot for you so you can figure out what it is you'll be voting on. So with that, we are going to return to workshop um, in the other room, so we're going to pick up where um, uh, Mr. Ferris left off and, and continue our, our workshop meeting. if you want to go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Mayor and Council, uh, I want to go backwards just a little bit, have a little bit more time, but we'll, we'll be uh, efficient in moving through this, this uh, presentation. But again, I can't stress enough about staff involvement, but as well as what you're seeing here, as I'll point out, this is Mr. Mark Watford, a principal owner of BBW and BRW. He's been very involved in design and attending meetings, which is not, I would not say that's of everyday projects, not typical. And so, you know, he's been very involved. Of course, Stephen's going to say that. That's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but going around the horn, you'll see Jason Moore with Byrne. That is our CMAR last week involved in the design of this building. And again, when you talk about value engineering, that's where the rubber meets the road and that two Burn employees are here providing their input in the design of the building, which is, again, the uniqueness and what makes the CMAR the best thing. You'll see in the back, this is Chris Presley with facilities and ADA and representing Keith Marvin's Department of Public Services at this point. You'll see David McAllister with IT back here, and they're talking about the site as well. And again, I already spoke about Jeremy, here's Stephen on the ground here doing the game plan, kind of like the Sandlot. They're drawing and going with different plans, but a very involved process that a lot of key players aren't sitting back. They're rolling up the sleeves because, again, this is a very technical, very complicated project that involves many things. Again, if I advance this into the utility uh, site of the 16 acres, again, remember, that we have under design right now Civic Circle and Valley Parkway. That's RPS Engineering. Mr. Kyle Hogue is their design engineer that started this design well before this project came along. To date, we still do not have a civil engineering site plan of this site, but we're starting to get, again, a building mass and footprint to where we know our domestic water, <laughs> our fire protection, our fire sprinkler underground service mains coming into this site, sanitary sewer drainage so we're starting to know where these leads need to be the good thing and the bad thing is this is simultaneous with this capital project kind of like council we have an architect and we have a civil engineer so i have to be careful what i say because they can correct me really quick we have a finance person and our SEL, and we have someone with local knowledge here and mayor's involved and mr Troyer who can do a an integrated circle you know, in, the back, in the back of his head. So this is really one of those projects that has three real movements going on. You have an off-site civil uh, CIP bond project as well as an on-site um, building and off-site moving. We also have fiber. We'll talk about it. But again, we are very interested now that these building footprints are getting locked down to where our, you'll see the blue, that's an eight inch water line that loops through the site. It's gotta be relocated through that drive. That drive is gone. It will no longer be off Valley Parkway. The green is sanitary sewer. Has to, has to be relocated and reconfigured all the while to keep it, keep it running because again, the annex is occupied. Herring will be occupied. So the storm sewer in purple, this all has to dance, but more importantly, it has to dance with what 
RPS is doing out on Valley Parkway and Civic. There are utility lines that would be brand new in Valley Parkway. Um, Council Woman Green did a, a water line replacement in a former life on Civic, nearly down to Main, but not quite, so we'll have that leg as well. What you're seeing here is the building over the site. You'll see the parking garage, you'll see the new campus here, but what's more important is the new driveway connections. Well, that affects the median openings, the turn lanes, and everything associated with the capital project at Valley Parkway and Civic, and that's a very delicate dance. We have an engineering site plan required for the 16 <coughs> acres, which mandates diesel lanes, control of access, and driveways, but we have to be in concert with our capital project here. So, for example, this diesel lane, the right turn lane, excuse me, southbound main to west to westbound uh, Main Street. This is required because of the engineering site plan of this site. With the acquisition of this property, we're going to have to design this turn lane in here, which will probably mandate signal relocations. That's a costly item. You'll also see that the driveway up here will be closing, because the buildings here, that drive that you pass through from Valley Parkway to the south will no longer be there. But we do have a new entry just south of that, so that mandates noses of medians, medians being uh, reduce back. This turn lane won't be there anymore, so that's a new, you'll see that this will be the new median here. The nose comes up here now, that'll be deleted to accommodate a five bay driveway connection for the new central station. That way they can come out and go northbound Valley Parkway or southbound uh, Valley Parkway and get it done. Now, in concert, and Christian, you'll appreciate this, that all these drives over here conflict, so this is going to have to be really looked at because that's a really wide median opening. By code, this is supposed to be a left turn bay. We're probably not going to do that because we're going to put the left turn bay up here and encourage people to come into this center through this turn lane. Can we close these driveways? Maybe, yes, but that's a mutual access easement. All of these are, so all parties on that eastern campus would have to agree with that. We don't have time, there's no need, so at this point we're making RPS is civil drawings in compliance with what's happening with with Hart Goggler's civil design of this site handed down from a footprint from BRW. There will be a new desal lane on Main Street here to this driveway. We're going to close the short driveway here that has all transition with no stack. It's a dangerous it's a dangerous move now. If you're not getting out of the way and making this turn in, you might get hit. There's a full D cell here with 100, 100 stack, 110 transition, or 210 here to Civic Circle, but we'll close this drive and it'll actually help efficiency of the roadway, be safer. And again, we're going to put staff parking in here on Parks and Recreation to get a lot of the staff that will be working in Herring back off of the front. So you can appreciate what's going on with trying to merge these two projects, the Valley Parkway and Civic. We're in between 60 and 90 percent drawings now. We have it to back up a little bit, but they're working on this new design now. The Civic and Valley Parkway job will probably let and go to construction, just call it January of, of 23. About the same time, December 20, 22 of 23, that we start phase one construction here of LPSC. So it already is going to be a very, you know, tight dance of construction, but the Civic Valley Parkway job will probably be finished, I would say, I would say probably uh, January of 24. It will be finished and in before the LPSC opens. Another complicating factor or opportunity that we're looking at is uh, working with, in Chris Lee's shop, with what do we do with fiber that's existing on the site? It's going to have to be relocated, and then can we build in some redundancy to better serve Louisville for the decades and make a more sustainable design in that. So, you can see the red line that comes in now uh, off of the corner, and I'll show you the choke point. It's coming into the annex right now through, right underneath where the parking garage is going to be. There's also a secondary line that comes off and angles in over here. So we've got to deal with this relocation of fiber. Well, how do we do that? This is a better look at what you have existing now. So this is mandating redesign. So we have an opportunity to maybe bring in 
a fiber line to the east side of the station and get inside the building this way, have a redundant loop coming around Civic on the North Parkway, probably in four inch uh, roll duct conduit, and come into the library and get underneath the building and come through the building all the way through. There's a chase under there. Uh, but again, this is an opportunity to get this done, get it out from where someone can hit it. Well, why, what happens if they hit it? Well, that knocks out 911. It's very expensive, could, and it knocks out our fiber loop to the city because we come out and go down South Valley Parkway, which, by the way, we have to coordinate the turn lane because we don't have to deal with that because it's in that parkway going south toward Thrive that can, has the city loop. So we're in a very important part of design right now, dancing between <coughs> architecture, on-site civil, and off-site civil with many, many departments. So that's what we're doing right now. And we have several breakout meetings last week, more to come. They're drawing up these schematics right now, and we're looking at that. And pretty much, as Fire Chief would say, we are stop, drop, and rolling and making this happen. Uh, this is a top priority because, as Mr. Squadron would say, pedal to the metal because the more delay, the more it's maybe going to cost us. So that's what's going on with the site concepts. I'd like Stephen to walk you all through um, some of the conceptual floor plans and some of the space allocations and start talking about what the building is doing. You can stand or you can sit. Okay. So uh, we're going to show you, what we're going to show you is conceptual still. Uh, we're still working through uh, more detailed testing the plan, so the design process. Uh, you put something on paper, you come back, you test it, you make sure that it works the way it needs to for everybody, and then you revise. And you repeat that process until we get the right, uh, the right function uh, in each of the spaces. So. Uh, it's a little too small to really read it, but that's fine because it's, it's going to change a little bit uh, yet in the future. But there's a few things that, uh, to draw your attention to. Um, one is that on the parking um, garage and support structure, the bottom floor is taken up by uh, <coughs> support vehicles, special <coughs> use vehicles for police and fire. So all the parking is really happening on upper levels. Uh, that means that this bridge across from the... Um, Water doesn't work on the oh, glass. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> that the bridge across to the police station is uh, necessary uh, functionally for the patrol uh, to get from the parking back and forth to the second floor of the police station. Um, another thing that you'll notice is that the second floor here, the program is larger than what's on the first floor. So this shape may or may not be the final shape of, of the building, um, but it does mean that there's an opportunity to do something in the massing um, that has an, a an overhang of the second floor with the first floor, and we're working that into uh, the way that, uh, into the primary uh, guiding principles uh, that we had in our visioning sessions and, and how that plays in. And I'll show you a little bit of that, of that more here in, in a second. Uh, and then the fire station is up to the north, um, so fire station up here with the bays, so the firefighters get their own kind of uh, courtyard outdoor space because uh, they have a, a need for that that's separate from everyone else. Um, you'll also see that there's a courtyard that's kind of formed here within the police, and that becomes a very central element for us as well. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, a very uh, inviting public front corner is, is a requirement for this project, and uh, that's another one of our major uh, themes to it. So generally, um, laying out with investigations, um, records, lobby, um, on the first floor, and the courtyard that I mentioned in the middle uh, is kind of the hub of the activity that happens for the staff. So not just the courtyard itself, but all the sp face spaces that face around towards it uh, all work together in concert to create a, a facility that really helps with the collaboration between departments and the camaraderie and, and the, the focus on people um, that goes along with with your uh, Louisville way and, and values of the city. And that carries into the second floor as well. Some of those spaces um, that face that courtyard from the second floor level play into that central theme as well. And generally the fire administration, police administration, uh, the traffic lockers and patrol on the second floor, uh, the possibility of a roof patio that also plays into um, overlooking that courtyard space. Stephen, um, can you go back to that other slide? Let's, again, I think what we learned from, and the Chiefs can speak to this, was from Richardson 
grapevine and the others. This is an attached fitness area of about 1,500, 1,800 square feet. So a large workout room, fitness room. It's in the building, but it's not above or below another use. When they're dropping weights or what they're doing, it won't affect the building, but it gives them some isolation where they can work out without having, you know, a bunch of chiefs walk by and glare at them through the glass. But, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but again, it gives them that, that area that's in between the apparatus, the, the firefighters can respond from there. It's close by the centralized training and EOC areas of this level. So again, it's in concept, but I think this is really important that um, I think Richardson had to add on to an outside. They didn't make it big enough, and so the others are always saying that it's loud. And so I think this is going to be a good design for our employees. And as Steve was saying, the courtyard that you'll see in a minute is kind of a neat place with the balcony coming out of the second floor. But again, I think that's an important element uh, for our employees to have. And, and each, each portion of it is very thought out as to where it goes in relationship to other parts. As Eric was saying, the fitness has a very close relationship to the bay. That was important for response time to the fire department. So, uh, <clears throat> we are going to show you a little bit of massing. I do want to preface that uh, the massing that we're going to show you is not the shape or look of the building. It's to give you a, a sense of the scale of the building and the way that the con our major um, concepts are playing into how the courtyards uh, form, um, go along with our, with our organizing principles, and uh, how they, they interrelate to each other. So the relationship of the spaces to each other, the general volume of space, and the size of it related to the other buildings, it's not to imply that this is actually what the building's going to look like. We aren't there yet, and we will bring that update to you as soon as we have consensus that that's ready to show you and was something that we all love. So our organizing principles that I have uh, mentioned a few times, um, we took inspiration from the Louisville Way. This came out of our visioning sessions. And we know from past work with the city that you really do live this. And uh, not only through the city, all, all city departments, you have excellent staff, by the way. Um, I, I rarely work with such a great group. And uh, we know that the, the public safety departments in particular live this every day. So uh, we took some inspiration from one of each of your three main values um, in valuing people and in value, serving every day and building the future. And these are kind of the words that stuck out to us in our visioning sessions. The people, the service, and looking towards the future. And so as we look at that in terms of how do you uh, convert this into something that has symbolic meaning within a structure. Uh, first, we have to look at what these uh, what these pieces of your Louisville Way really mean. Uh, people is all about relationships, and so building strong relationships with the public and within the departments and between the departments is something that already exists, and this building needs to reflect that. Service uh, is about outreach. It's also about shelter. It's about uh, for public safety departments taking care of, of people. And so it's uh, focused on um, protection as well. Future, um, one of the things that you think of when you think about future is light, lighting the way towards the future. So uh, it's a strong um, metaphor that can be used to tie in with the Louisville Way and our guiding principles. And how that relates into actual built form um, that we're proposing the relationships are shown in the courtyard, and the outreach is shown in a front porch that is inviting to the public and shows shelter and protection. And the light is reflected in a lantern. And I'm going to show you uh, generally in block massing form how this plays into our building. Uh, I mentioned before that we have that central courtyard. <coughs> um, that is the hub of the activity of, on the staff side. And it's a very important organizing element in our facility. The porches, I mentioned that we have this overhang, additional square feet that happens on the second floor. That gives us the, uh, the inspiration and the opportunity to create porches that create that type of image. And then the lantern um, stems from 
the ability to uh, show that guiding light to the future, but also the program requires us to have uh, a deep enough building that you can't get light into all the interior spaces, so it's light to the, to the people who are guiding the way for us in this facility, our public safety officials. It's also a beacon of light to uh, the public that it might it would shine. So that's kind of our three organizing principles. It doesn't mean it will look like this, but those elements are part of uh, our design inspiration. So we did something very similar. Um, Stacy with BRS, and at first a lot of us staff were like, yeah, let's get on with it, let's get, but they were talking about liminal, the space between, what were some of the other words that they used to design, it was liminal space, they always opened their presentation with that, but at the end of the day, when you got on site, you saw the bioswells, you saw nature, the rock and the artwork with the birds that carried from the outside to inside, when they walked in, it was the liminal, was this, you didn't know whether to go forward and enjoy where you were. So a lot of those words transitioned into real things in the experience at Thrive, a slightly different building, but we're going to get there with this, and it'll be meaningful. We don't know what it looks like yet, but it will be meaningful and very functional in the, the things that Stephen was, was pointing out. Ah, I don't want to do that. Well, no, just go here. Stephen, yeah. if you want me to stop at any point, just uh, I, can, I can run through the first time that I need to run through it again. Okay. This case. So this is kind of showing you from the front. It has uh, got that front uh, plaza as well as porch. <coughs> if you come around, the fire station reflects the architecture in the same way. There is a courtyard particular for the fire station, uh, firefighters, and then the main courtyard around which the life of the rest of the staff revolves. So, so, yeah, so you, I've stopped it, so you can talk about this, the balcony option here for maybe the dispatchers or people versus the balcony over the fitness area with maybe a shade structure, no fountains, in the courtyard area. <laughs> Again. So there's, there's, as I said, the plan is still evolving, so the elements may or may not look exactly like this, but the idea of everything from a staff point standpoint of the major people uh, spaces within the facility facing that courtyard is very important so that uh, that's the life and the interaction that occurs within and between the departments. I think what the idea is that I think some of you all in Councilman K, you might have asked that, you know, will you see, when you come back to the first elevation, <laughs> will you see the parking garage above, above, up and beyond? I think the answer is yes. If you I go think, forward just a bit, you'll see a yeah. lower profile. It's so, not quite vision from the ground level, but I think you will see it peeking out above the building. Really big building, but you'll have, and again, it won't look like panel. This, this is blocks. It won't look like this, but the mass of this with really the first floor, second floor with movement there, you get really a, a third elevation here in the difference here. The, the skylights or the lighting or the glass up here will be number four with this in my mind being five and this may be six. And I read a civil engineering scale, not an architecture scale. But I think there's a good opportunity here to pose this. And again, it changes as you go around to this view, I think is really cool. There's a lot going on here with the opportunities on the north side of Central Station. Again, looking back, you see a lot of interesting viewpoints. We have an opportunity maybe and Chris has pointed out in, in BRW is that, again, these views from Main Street, well, there's a chance we can do some things to the parking garage, either perforated metal with artwork in it. I don't know that we'd be interested in the first two or three decks, but again, there's opportunities to make this parking garage look really cool from this viewpoint to the citizens, um, not make it loud or whatnot, but there's, there's ways that we can do louvers horizontal or vertical, or the perforated metal with art in it, perhaps, up here to do some things to these different elevations when you start looking at, at what's going on here. Again, this view back here would be from the north side, but I think they've good, done a good job to represent what could be a very large building with a parking garage on the site with herring in the annex and the library here, all in the mix with the county buildings. <coughs> It's our presentation. Good.
Well, we'll take, we have to answer your questions. Chris <laughs> and Steve, would you address the question about availability of product on the temporary central station modulars and uh, the apparatus base of what your people are telling you? Yeah. Let me uh, jump in there on the on that fabric structure. Um, talking to the contractor, if we don't, if we buy something as you mentioned that is stock. Um, it's a six to eight week lead from when we have a uh, approved contract with them to get it here. So our move date is October 15th. Um, the modulars themselves, we're going to try and make as few modifications to the stock um, from the factory and not customize them so they'll ship quickly and then have the contractor make the modifications inside the temporary. And those are also about an eight to ten week lead. Does that... Um, is that That's ten? generally what we're hearing so far. And as you said, uh, lead times are always subject to the newest thing that happens, but right now we're hearing very favorable information that that's going to work for us. So I, I had a similar question um, about, the, about the construction of the new building because, um, because the lead times are so all over the place and just in the last week I was told that it would take 9 to 12 months to get a, a the breakers, the electrical panel and breakers. Um, how, um, I see that we're talking about the schedule not changing. I assume that's subject to change based on availability of material. If you want to go back to that slide, um, we, we have a start date that hasn't changed. And then the, um, the, the same intermediate um, supply chain headwinds could change the schedule. There's a lot of innovation going on right now with switch gear, electrical switch gear, which is your brake, you know, even 20 amp breakers now are difficult to get. But there are electrical subcontractors who are building transformers and panels in house uh, to short circuit that. There are, uh, remember when, I don't know, maybe you weren't here then, but maybe you were. Um, we, on um, Keith's project, we, we did an early bid package for yeah, steel, steel and we ordered that in advance mm -hmm. to beat the lead time. So we'll have a generator package, elevators, um, and, and switch gear and electrical pieces. We'll have packages of long lead, which is another advantage of the Seymour. Um, you want to go forward a little bit, please, Eric? So, okay, one more. One, well, one more slide, sorry. So, this slide. Um, so, this date is TBD, and we deliberately have made this fairly open. I mean, that's fall and winter. That's like a, that's two quarters, right? So we're, um, we're cautiously optimistic that we can um, meet some of these deadlines. Um, elevator packages are probably going to be the longest lead that we have. But the temporary pieces is the scariest for us right now because we have to move police and fire out by October 15th to start demolition. So let's just say... Um, I think headwinds is still the right word. <laughs> we're, we're flying, uh, we're going to make it work. Um, but this schedule slide will start filling in with more dates as we do more updates. Okay. Thank you. That makes me feel better. Well, I understand we, that there's no guarantees, but I know you're on top of it. And well, I, we're, I know that that list of things that are long lead times continues to... It seems like it continues to grow with, you know, things just keep getting added to that list. So, I, but I know you're on it. So. Well, what's really interesting is steel has dropped to seven months lead, and it used to be 12 to 14 months. So you're seeing some things the market's reacting to, and others um, we hope will follow suit. But... That's why we gave ourselves that six months fudge at the end there, right? Yeah. 
we'll fill that in with the right dates as we know them. Until then, we're all on the train together. Council, do you yes, have we are. any other? I left off one mayor oh, on next step. So we're going to bring, again, we're working very hard to finalize our leases both for Lakeway as well as First Baptist and try to get those back by the 16th or the first meeting of June. But we need to get those run to ground. And again, we're working very well with both both representatives of both properties. So that's what we're working on feverishly now. Again, we'll continue. We have a big meeting this Wednesday, involvement in design <coughs> of all of it, really, from the architectural and civil. So um, a big day Wednesday. We're getting started with the final plat. Michelle's going to keep us out of trouble on the platting, and David with his firm on the engineering support. So we're melding those two documents as we get the footprint, as we discuss. So that's underway with a, a whole other set of employees, or some, in, some the same in some cases. Again, integrating that, those capital projects with the IT function, uh, with, with fiber and whatnot. We will finalize conceptual renderings or visions, as they call it, bring that back to council for your approval. We'll probably bring back, bring back up to at least three options on aesthetics or what you would like to see. Uh, so you won't just have one. You may have two or three uh, to choose from, perhaps, on how that would look. What we, we as staff will promise is as soon as we get information that we really, that we need or we will have, that we've determined or need input continuously back through the various departments, whether it's fire department or the police department, sending it down to patrol or investigations or EMS or through operations of suppression or prevention, we will get that input and feedback as we start crossing these thresholds, what we really can't do is back tread from schematic design or start moving pods around because that's going to set us back in time, which costs us money and Chris will kill us all. Right. Well, so I think, I think it's going to be a, a real intimate dance, but fast moving dance to get that information through all various ranks, not only their departments, but through the campus. I mean, Carolyn's not going to be very happy if her customers can't get in the library or Stacy at Parks, so there's a lot that's, that's really not static, it's evolving. So all departments will be, are, and are involved, and are involved in this, and we are, as I don't make this thing that makes sense, but we're thinking, of, we're talking as we're thinking, and we're thinking as we're talking, which means we're doing it on the fly, but we have to because of what's going on, and we're, we're all, in, all hands on deck. So that's, that's where we are. But we will be bringing back more <coughs> briefings to you all, a little bit more focused, uh, as we go down, but we are in a very critical point right now of everything's coming into the mixing bowl. So that's where we are. So I'm sorry, Quit. Wow. Thank you for a fantastic job. And good job, Neil, finding that piece of property. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's going to be much better than We can that. sign you up as well. Mr. Ferris, could, could you pull the 360 back up for a second? Yes, sir. And I'm going to ask you to please take my comments in the spirit that they are intended, which is not to micromanage. Um, I, I had three things that I saw that I, on this process that I, I, I'm going to assume you guys took into consideration, but I want to make sure. Um, I, there's going to be a lot of people walking into this big, beautiful entryway, and they're going to be directed to the jail. It's just the way this looks like it'll flow to me so I just want to make sure that we've got good workflow yes sir and a, and a nice you know, inviting space for people as they walk over to the jail um, as Very required good point. and I think again this is where our architectural site plan and our civil site plan start to as, as Steve would say invite so again the, and again these parking lots um, are fairly generic still. I mean, we're tightening these down. Do we need to see a parking or not? But again, this area right here will be inviting. We have right now 1100 uh, West Main. Yeah. 184, 188. So again, we may have one base address with with suites. We don't know. But our focus is to make, as we said, a cornerstone approach to this intersection where you pull in, you know that this is going to be the intro point. Now, this will still be the jail, and yep. there's no taking that away. But again, our focal point <coughs> is here, but point well taken, Mayor, that we've got to, 
address this to where people can know that they flow in and go, you know, they go police or fire admin or come up and again a lobby with records, which has a lot of public uh, going there now, yeah. as opposed to left and right here. Yeah. So yes, sir, we're very focused in on that focal point and make a natural uh, entryway. I think Richardson, with Chief Hoovey, was saying that we get people every day looking for police. Is that what he said? And they really don't understand you. You really don't know. Even the best sign is the worst thing to do is put a bunch of signs out here when your building didn't address it in market. Well, and, and what, I, what I'd hate is that people go in and they feel like it's too far, so they get in their car just to go to the next parking lot over, which I feel like we kind of do today in the space to get from space to space. Um, so if there's a way to make that walk more inviting and encourage people to park, and it's an easy walk. Um, I think that kind of goes more with our... Green centerpiece and some of our values, trying to get people to be a little more healthy. So just just thinking out loud on that. No, sir, you're exactly um, right. And again, our restricted areas here, we're going to take out the drive-through. So we will have to put a drop-off pod somewhere on the annex site for water billing, and whatnot. We're still thinking through for court fines and after hours, they can probably still come to the jail or whatnot. But the drive-through that they're using still for water bills or late night. That's going to have to go away for the sally port, but this area here would be gated and controlled for security. So it is going to be a problem from getting from this side of the campus around, however, through the boulevard, either through a nice walkway, or they can come out and come in here, or come back around. So there's, no, there's not much we can do to get around right. that side of mobility, but again, I agree with you, and we're wholeheartedly looking at this to see... Well, where am I? It's a big, it'll be a big complex, as you point out on the 60. But yes, sir, you're right. We need to do a really great job of addressing this facility to the community. That way they know where to go in. And I, and I do like the thought of the, the overhang. I mean, that does make it a friendly or walkable <coughs> space when, when you get and that yeah. human scale in there. So. And it won't have the panel look of herring. Yeah. It's very tired. Again, the Soto and some of those others that I showed you, they have this. It just looks different. That there's yeah, and I, 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 you know, I saw the little, mm -hmm. and I get it. It's blocking and massing, and we're trying to make it human scale, but still be able to create a, a sense of space, right, and a sense of location. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. My other, other bit of, and this one's just maybe it's more my personal privilege. Um, I love our little rotary with the desert willows, and it's going to go away. I know oh, really? that it's one of my favorite spaces. Um, and the flags there on the corner, I think, really speak to this is your city, uh, you know, and it, and it gives you that massing. So I, I, I hate that we probably will lose that. I can see that in the design. Um, but if there's something we can do to make sure that there is kind of that space, whether that's on the other corner or, or where we can create kind of a, a green space that speaks to, you know, local uh, flora, um, makes things a little bit more welcoming, gives us the flags. I see that you've got another set of flags kind of here at the side in one of the drawings. So um, I just, I don't want us to lose in the speed to market, I don't want us to lose some of the human touch points that we have. Um, so that, that, so I'm not asking you to replace the rotary, I'm not asking you to do desert willows. I just, I, I, I worry that if this moves so fast, it just becomes concrete slabs. Uh, and that's not what we want. I, I feel like we're, you guys understand that, but I, th I just want to reinforce that, if that's okay. Yeah, con concrete slabs is not one of the, the Not one of the design words. criteria. <laughs> I get it. Um, so so those, those were my two you know, pieces there. I love the inviting entry. Um, and I don't know if any council has any other pieces that they want to add, but that's, that's my nickel. One question, the, the yearly event that Central Fire Station has, has that been looked into as far as the, the the back area and how if that's going to work with what that event is all about? Mm -hmm. uh, the open house? Yes. Yes, we, we have talked about that. The uh, PD has an open house also, so we're trying to figure out how to make that spot. And, and we've talked about maybe using the green space in front of these buildings, but uh, actually designating where that's going to be and how it will work has not worked out yet. But that will be part of it. That, is, that has been in the conversation. Okay. That's awesome. Anyone else? We'll be back. I know you will. Carl Swartz, we will be back. I know, you will. I know you will. I really appreciate the update. It's, I mean, this is, this is a phenomenal project and, and all the moving parts. I, I'm very, very excited we have you guys as the team. It's, it's, it's good work. 
All right, if there's nothing else, we need to go back and I can join the meeting. We don't have anything for closed session. There is no other business to be taken, so I will hereby uh, close this meeting of the Louisville City Council. It is um, 8-19. We are adjourned. <laughs>